Welcome everyone. My name is Kato Samuel and I'm the chair of the All Party Group for Nigeria. And I'd like to welcome you to our event today to discuss Nigeria and COVID-19, the implications of governance, security and development. We have a panelist of three esteemed speakers and I'm really looking forward to hearing from them. Before we start and before we before I introduce you to our panelists I want everyone to know that they have an opportunity to ask questions once all three speakers have spoken you will be able to raise your hand and which is the function which you will find amongst um all of our um what's the word what's the right word for me um you will see that you know how to use zoom I know that you guys know how to use Zoom, so I don't need to explain to you how to raise your hand, not physically raise your hand, but actually press the button to raise your hand and you'll be able to ask questions. So without any further ado, I want to first welcome our panelists. As I said, we have three. Our first speaker is Aidat Hassan. She's a director of the Center for Democracy and Development in West Africa. We also have Dr. Lena Kuni Hoffman, Associate Fellow of the Africa Program at Chatham House. And our third speaker will be Bulama Bukati, PhD cand candidate at SOAS, University of London, and an analyst at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. I also want to thank Chatham House, who is the Secretariat for the All Party Group for Nigeria. And I'm looking forward to hearing from our three speakers. Our first speaker is going to speak about the impact of COVID-19 on governance and politics in Nigeria. And I will give you some details of the biography of our fantastic speaker. Idat, Hassan is Director of Centre for Democracy and Development, an Abuja-based policy advocacy and research association focused on deepening democracy and development in West Africa. She's also a lawyer and has held fellowships in universities across Europe and America. 
Her interests span across democracy, peace and security, transitional justice and ICT4D in West Africa. Aidyat frequently appears in international and local media as an expert on Nigeria and West Africa, including for the BBC, CCTV, RFI, Bloomberg, Washington Post, Financial Times, Guardian, the list goes on. So I want to welcome Aidat to speak for 10 minutes to the audience. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Kate. It's my pleasure to be speaking today and uh, especially to, to share what is happening in Nigeria, being there at this point in time. And, and the last few months, it's been quite interesting for us here on the, in the country. It's been interesting, but there are also positives as we believe that we may actually emerge from this pandemic stronger. But it's also important to note that this COVID-19 pandemic has actually revealed state capacity, the weakness of the Nigerian state in ways that we never knew of. For instance, when it comes to health, many Nigerians from all walks of life, not just the elite, never really realized how dilapidated the healthcare system was. They never knew that the bulk of health workers were largely informal and at the community level, or that some states did not even have up to 200 doctors to cater to millions of their citizens. This uh, pandemic also revealed the varying capacity at subnational level. Finally, Nigerians could see that even though Lagos State and Ekiti State are both in Southwest Nigeria, but they are far and so different in terms of capacity. The problem of federalism, of course, became very obvious as co governance mechanism at different scales demonstrates three very important problems, which was one, the problems of coordination, unhaven capacities, and claims of authority. In the same vein, the social and economic dy dimensions of the crisis is also affecting states and communities differently. And one thing that became very important to us finally was leadership matters. Whosoever is at the arms of affairs will definitely have impact on the level of preparedness of the healthcare system, the social security structure, and of course the infrastructural capacity in itself. But what I would really like to point out at this point in time, and which I'm sure my colleagues will speak to, is that the pandemic is further perpetrating and widening inequalities in Nigeria. Now, it's important to note that this is collective action is actually needed in terms of addressing this pandemic from all, uh, by citizens. This is largely missing because most citizens continue to believe till this moment that this whole idea about the coronavirus is another opportunity for politicians to actually siphon resources. So it's a fluke. While others believe, underestimate the risk the virus actually poses to health. Now the government responses itself has been very, very interesting. Um, maybe quite proactive when you look at legal states and on the national level, lots of measures have been introduced from the beginning with lockdown measures introduced in like in Abuja, Lagos, uh, Ogun State and later on in Kano State. Because of the subnational nature of the states, they also introduced some form of lockdown measures, including coffees, banning of interstate travel, Emergency laws were also introduced somewhere in some of those states. So if you take Rivers as an example, the introduction of the executive order was not only used, was not only used to climb down human rights, but was also used to destroy property, really. In the guise of enforcing lockdown, we actually saw a lot of human rights infraction. The National Human Rights Commission puts the figure of dead people 
killed by the uh, security agencies agents to 29, but they still have over 100 cases that they are investigating here. Importantly, using COVID-19 as, uh, um, as a basis, opposition forces and journalists in particular have been targeted. So come to Adamawa, Delta, Kogi, Cross River are just some of the several examples in terms of what happened in the country. There has been lockdown, at least 10 lockdown uh, protests, 10 protests that we have recorded in response to lockdown measures within the country. And you will wonder why some of these things are happening because it's both citizens and from the government. It's more that the government response in tackling the COVID-19 itself has been faced with this widening distrust by citizens, largely fueled by the inequitable sharing of social welfare packages, which we call palliatives locally, security sector abuse in the guise of enforcing lockdown, and of recent extortion for failure to wear face masks, as well as the insecurity pervading different parts of the country. So you people see, they say, okay, the insecurity is actually killing so many people more than the so-called uh, COVID-19 um, here from Boko Haram to Edis Farmers Conflict, um, rural banditry, um, they are all now becoming a pointer to what is actually defining the COVID-19 response. Now on the political front, it's quite interesting because COVID-19 actually showed us that it could not just shut down the economy, but it actually initially shut down politics in Nigeria. At the onset of the uh, pandemic, there was a huge uproar in the ruling party, the All Progressive Congress, over suspension or not of the chairman. For like one month, politics was at a low. But subsequently, this became a, a big brouhaha that even they have a caretaker in, in place. But what is important are those two critical governorship elections in Edo and on those states, and at least 13 other legislative elections that will be held in the country. But the Ondo and the Edo elections are very, very important elections that we really have to talk about. Yes, INEC has introduced, the election management body has introduced COVID-19 response uh, policy, and they will be trying it in Nasarawa at a state uh, by-elections, state constituency by-elections this weekend. But preparations for Undo and Edo are in full gear, in spite of the fact that the numbers of cases keep skyrocketing. So if you check the numbers now, Edo state is number four on the list. But in those states, the states, the parties chose direct primaries and indirect. Direct primaries for APC, where all card-carrying members of the parties are expected to come, queue, and select who will be their candidates in these elections. Campaign are in full gear. In Nondo State, the governor, three days um, after he was seen coughing publicly, was declared positive of coronavirus itself. Whosoever will emerge the winner in these two state elections, COVID-19 itself will have a part to play in how well it is instrumentalized or not. But moving ahead from politics on ground is also the politics of COVID-19 itself and the way it's been manifesting. Some states, of course, have denied the existence of COVID-19 in their states, in particular Kogi and Cross River states, where even some called it a distraction, disrupted a planned press conference by the doctors in the state while another governor actually sacked the coordinator of his COVID-19 response for not towing the lines. There has been what we've called mysterious ca uh, death cases surfacing in places like Yobe, Kano, Jigawa, Bauchi, and Gombe states, all in Northern Nigeria. These deaths are declared mystery because they say they don't know, but verbal autopsies conducted have confirmed some, that some of them are actually due to COVID-19, such that the Kano case 
At the end of it, the Minister for Health in Nigeria claimed that at least 587 of those over 900 dead people actually died from COVID-19. Mind you, these numbers are not reflected in the official figures of dead people. More governors are also playing games with these COVID-19 uh, responses. In particular, either in under declaring or no testing. So we had a test, a case where the state actually tested 38 people and 31 were declared positive but today they have only 64 positive patients in that state as well. Why some have actually closed our isolation center in itself. The presidential tax force of course is trying to do a very good job in terms of briefing Nigeria, but the inclusivity is also a challenge noting that there is only one female representation on that board. But the business, the core business of governance itself seems to have been jettisoned in Nigeria with so much focus on COVID-19, both at the national and the state level. I do acknowledge that the vice president of Nigeria led an economic sustainability plan. Uh, they came up with this plan, but not that the government actually suspended all federal executive council meeting until May 12th of the same year. At the state national level, there seems to be selective penchant to focus on COVID-19 at the expense of other government businesses itself. Civil servants are working from home, but the business of providing palliatives, supporting communication, bringing about innovation, the issue of Niger Delta Development Commission and the huge scandal surrounding spending of COVID-19, it's a, it's a challenge. In fact, it might just be right to say that this COVID-19 response may actually lead to more abuse of office and corruption in Nigeria. Even though the watchdogs, which will be on the field, looking at this issue are also incapacitated with the COVID-19 response. Security, uh, food implications my colleague will actually talk about, but the economic crisis associated with COVID-19, particularly the humongous number of jobs that have been lost, the inability of, of uh, companies, states to pay staff, people lost, losing their families, the disparity in education may do have a potential to have caused governance crisis in the country. Now, coupled with the drop in oil prices, the demand for the oil itself, the depreciation in Naira against dollars are very, very important. The resilience of Nigeria is always relied on the informal and informal sector and the familiar support system. Where in diet, for instance, we support 50 members of both extended families and friends. But all this is becoming impossible because everybody is impacted by COVID-19 one way or the other. So when we look at this all together, there is the potential that this pandemic will stress the already fragile governing system, but not necessarily the same way it will in the Western world. It is likely not going to be the number of deaths and illness that is going to disrupt governance. Instead, it might be the repressive measures adopted in the face of curbing a looming breakdown of law and order. The economic recession and the accompanying fiscal crisis itself will definitely be utilized by kleptocrats to steal more money at the expense of provision of public goods and services for Nigerians. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Aydat. Um, I really appreciate your perspective on what is happening in Nigeria and the response to COVID-19 and the pressure that it's having on civilians, the lack of trust, and the way that opposition parties and the journalists have been impacted, and moreover, the lack of coordination from the government. I'm now going to move on to our second speaker, Dr. Lena Hoffman. 
Lena is an Associate Fellow of the Africa Programme at Chatham House and the Nigeria Country Lead for the Africa Programme Social Norms and Accountable Governance Project. She is also a Technical Advisor to the Permanent Interstate Committee for Drought Control in the Sahel and Consultant for the OECD's Sahel and West Africa Club Secretariat on Cross-Border Cooperation gender and women trade networks. Previously, Lena has consulted for the World Food Programme on their work in Nigeria and Niger on gender and agricultural markets. I welcome Lena. Thank you very much, Kate. And thank you to the rest of the panelists on this uh, webinar and also everyone participating uh, on this Zoom uh, um, discussion. So um, I'm going to talk uh, a bit about the food security and socioeconomic context of the pandemic in Nigeria. So Idayat has highlighted some of the things that I will try and pick up on. But I really want to talk about the food security situation and the socioeconomic consequences of uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, through two personal uh, uh, data points. So I'm Nigerian, um, but I live outside of uh, Nigeria. Uh, but since late May, two of my relatives, one in his early 30s and another early 40s, have had pandemic era babies. People are having babies in the midst of this, of course. Um, so one came in May and one arrived this morning, a boy. So uh, both of my relatives and their spouses work in the informal sector, which uh, Idai had referenced, around about 60 to 80% uh, of uh, people working in Nigeria fall in the informal sector at some point in their working life. You can even be in the formal sector, but engaging in business outside of it as well to augment income uh, and so on. Um, many involved in small business trading, uh, uh, transport and a range of services, hairdressing services, selling clothes and the like. So thinking about um, my relatives and their families, their very, very young families, um, they've really had quite a tough couple of years. Nigeria was in a recession in 2016, only delicately coming out of that um, so many household incomes have not recovered and livelihoods as well. I even got a text from one of the relatives this, this morning asking for any kind of uh, um, financial support I can provide, even as little as a thousand naira. So uh, that's around about two dollars. And I'm not just sharing that. Um, I did ask for permission to share that in my presentation this morning, but really kind of to reflect like Idayat has uh, reflected in my presentation and, and what I'm contributing as to how the numbers that we talk about um, regards to the impact of the pandemic are numbers, uh, are real people and not just numbers. So pre-pandemic poverty numbers in Nigeria were around about 86.9 million um, of um, Nigerians living in extreme poverty. And that's real numbers, real people in uh, the context of the largest population on the continent of Africa um, between 180 to 200 million people. Also, unemployment numbers in Nigeria were about 23.1% uh, last year, but um, those numbers are likely to rise to as high as 33.5% this year. And these, again, have real life consequences for millions of individuals and, and families. Um, the World Bank now predicts that Nigeria is heading towards its worst recession in 40, year, in 40 years, worse than what we saw in 2016. And the economy is likely to shrink uh, from 3.2 to uh, uh, and 7.4 percent this year. And if this arc continues to lean as it seems to be leaning in that direction, about 5 million more Nigerians will be pushed into poverty in 2020. And these are estimated numbers, of course. So there's never really a good time to have a pandemic for any country. Um, but there are conditions that make these kinds of uh, impacts or consequences significantly worse for more people. So Nigeria features very strongly on that list where it couldn't be a worse time uh, um, for 
a pandemic of this scale and nature. Um, like I said in the beginning of my presentation, um, the recession uh, uh, of 2016, um, recovery from that has been quite slow and really uh, very delicate. Oil prices, however, have fallen uh, uh, again since March. There have been quite substantial disruptions to global trade, uh, 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 trade flows. Lockdown measures, the continuous ones, the rolling ones and, and the like, have pretty much wiped uh, the slate clean of um, Nigeria's economic comeback coming out of uh, uh, the, the, the last recession. Um, the Vice President Osimbajo um, has, says, has said that the government anticipates that 39.4 million pandemic related job losses um, will happen by December. Um, and between the past April and May, um, over 40% of Nigerians employed in non-farm businesses have lost incomes. Um, the government has also has, in response to this, uh, reviewed its oil benchmark downwards um, for the national budget from $57 uh, um, to 25 per barrel. And oil production has been cut to reflect um, these realities. So it's come down from uh, um, 2.18 million to 1.94 million barrels per day. Nigeria's projected uh, fiscal deficit has more than doubled um, as a result of uh, uh, um, um, these economic uh, uh, context um, from 2.2 trillion Naira to 5.2 trillion, which represents about 3.7% of GDP. So um, like Idai had said earlier on, uh, um, the structural impact um, on the Nigerian economy is really not something we do not know about. Mainly, you know, the over-reliance on oil revenue. Um, but that aside, it has also revealed uh, many of the gaps and the vulnerabilities in the Nigerian economy. And as well, the vulnerabilities that most household face, households face daily. And a key impact that I want to underline um, you know, for our discussion uh, this afternoon is around food inflation. In May, um, while core inflation was 14%, food infl inflation in Nigeria has risen to over 15%, which is the highest rate in the past 26 months. The cost of living has risen, uh, um, and this is uh, reflected around uh, um, rent, uh, uh, transportation, etc. but more sharply and most powerfully reflected in the price of food. Um, early this month, uh, Nigeria's National Bureau of Statistics released its Living Standards Survey, which shows that more Nigerians are not able to afford food. Over 37% of households are exposed to the increase in food uh, products, and nearly 12% of these households have reduced their food co um, consumption as a coping response. So we can imagine uh, um, the dire consequences nutritionally uh, in every dietary way for um, particularly the most vulnerable uh, in, in these kinds of contexts, women and children in particular. Um, so we have to also consider alongside um, the fact of uh, food inflation, how um, those who are most food insecure spend whatever income they make on food itself. Um, overall, Nigerians spend more than 60% of their income on food. And, six, and since 2016, which seems to be a marker for a lot of the things that we've seen uh, um, deteriorating in the last couple of, in the last 26 months, um, food prices for basic staples that make up typical meals like rice, tomatoes, and oil have gone up. So um, there's an interesting index that I'd like to flag and happy to share it um, in the comments or at a later date, um, is um, the Jollof Index. And this is an index used by, um, developed or produced by um, a data consulting firm, SBM Intelligence. And they've been tracking food prices, prices since 2016 um, as, 
as a way to better understand the pinch of, of core inflation. Um, Jalof, if you are familiar with the Jalof Wars, you'd be familiar with the, with, with the meal Jalof. And it's something typically uh, eaten in most households all across the country. It's kind of a very universal picture um, for the price, a useful universal picture for the price of food. Um, so on, in the Jalof Index, Abuja shows the highest increase in food prices um, for your average Abuja resident, uh, resident family. It costs 59% more for them to make um, a pot of rice compared to uh, um, the lowest price area, which is Calabar in Cross River in the south-south zone of the country. Um, in parts of Lagos, um, which is the country's commercial capital in the southwest, and Idayat spoke about um, the pandemic in, in, in Lagos and with the numbers being higher there, um, food prices have gone up 50%. Um, and this is despite, you know, there has been an increase in, 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 in food production, agricultural production in Nigeria in the last year or so. For example, rice, um, rice production has gone up uh, 1.8 uh, million tons, but we're talking about the largest population on the continent and more food insecure people. Uh, and, and that rice production rate isn't going up as high as population and the rate of food insecurity. Um, in 2019, and this is significantly before the pandemic. And we spoke about this, I think, in two past uh, uh, webinars that we've had. Um, Nigeria was one of 10 countries uh, facing the worst food crisis globally. This is alongside Yemen, South Sudan, Sudan, Ethiopia, Afghanistan. It's not quite a list that people automatically put Nigeria on but it's really important to bear that in mind that even before um, the pandemic triggered all of these uh, um, food insecurity and socioeconomic uh, uh, um, consequences, Nigerians, um, round about 7.1 uh, million Nigerians were at risk of extreme food insecurity. And you can think of the impact of everything else we've talked about uh, um, this afternoon to those numbers. The World Food Program warns that these numbers are likely to double, unfortunately. Um, so food, and I think, um, I'm sure Bulama, um, the, my co-panelists will speak more about the security context, uh, but I want to also just mention that food and particularly hunger um, is very likely to be uh, a trigger point for instability in Nigeria. So the combination of um, the economic consequences, a lot of frustration among citizens with the government's response um, is really um, very potentially uh, um, dangerous for social order. And food supply chains have not recovered because of uh, um, the border closure measures that have been put in place for many of the other countries in West Africa, these border measures, um, closure measures were put in place because of the pandemic, but Nigeria closed its borders um, prior to this in August um, as in, in, in an attempt to address uh, smuggling uh, um, and also uh, put pressure on its neighbors to um, monitor and, and patrol their borders better. Um, so I just want to highlight a couple of other points before I hand over to my colleague, um, is around um, the challenges that informal workers and their households are facing. One of the real impacts that we see um, is that um, food price increases and uh, the vulnerability of households is sharper in urban areas. So it seems to, it's, it's tailoring, unfortunately, or just not tailoring, I think, overlaying uh, the same trajectory of um, the spread of the infection of the virus in a lot of these urban areas, specifically Lagos, Abuja, and Kano, we're seeing that the food prices have gone up mostly because um, rural supply chains have not been able to cope. Um, they've been disrupted because of interstate 
travel. Um, so most of the food being produced in rural Nigeria is simply not getting to markets in urban areas. There's also been a huge loss, as you would imagine, um, of uh, income for people operating in the food sector, um, especially for smallholder farmers who make up the bulk of the people in, of uh, individuals and, and households in this sector and small scale producers. Um, and again, it would be worth highlighting that this is a sharper impact or loss of income for women um, who predominantly are in the informal sector, but then uh, predominantly have to be resp are responsible um, for caring for children who are now at home as a result of schools being closed. Um, just the last, a couple of last points I wanted to make is, um, and I think we reflected on this in the last webinar we had around food security in West Africa, is a lot of the measures that have been put in place um, to control um, um, land movement have, have consequences for harvest seasons coming up. So we we're talking about that in the context of the June and August lean season and um, harvest um, seasonal workers who mostly travel interstate borders, across interstate borders and across regional borders um, in response to um, harvest demands have been restricted in the movement. So we're imagining you know, the, the domino effect, the knock-on effect on that, food, being, uh, food spoilage um, on farms, um, transport restrictions, and even the increase in cost for transporting goods, because even if you're moving stuff around, um, um, interstate uh, um, um, checkpoint management agencies, the police and the like, are putting an, uh, an extra cost for you moving things around. And that is reflected in the cost of food across um, the country. Um, just to close, I'd like to um, also underline some of the measures. Idayat spoke to some of them that the government has uh, attempted, uh, has put in place to address the socioeconomic impact. Um, alongside um, um, the committee, the tax force um, made up of all the ministries, uh, relevant ministries, and the NCDC, um, the National uh, uh, the, the Disease Control um, Body. Um, there's an interministerial team that's chaired by the VP, I think it's the Economic Sustainability Committee, and the team is uh, tasked with um, addressing short-term, long-term structural vulnerabilities. Just last week, um, the Vice President announced a stimulus package of 2.3 trillion. This is around 1.5% of, nat of national income. Uh, but of course, um, this stimulus package depends on oil prices and where the turning point of uh, the pandemic will be. Um, the government has also removed um, petrol subsidies. The central bank has finally uh, um, is finally uh, responding um, to the damage that has been done to the economy with the multiple exchange rate structure that it operated in the past, attempting to unify the exchange rate. There's been two devaluations uh, um, to address that, and of course we know um, the exchange rate has real um, consequences for trade um, and, and investor confidence. Um, there's also been um, efforts to distribute um, relief assistance in the form of food, cash transfers, and loan repayment waivers. Um, but given the scale um, of the challenges and the difficulties with identifying um, the most vulnerable households. Um, these numbers are really what's been done is quite unfortunately uh, a drop in the ocean. Um, the social register has been expanded from 2.6 million to 3.6 million households. But like I said earlier, at risk individuals and households like um, the relatives of mine I spoke about earlier on aren't captured in these uh, uh, registers. And Idayat has um, spoken about um, the real concerns and issues around transparency um, in procurement and distribution 
um, of um, the relief assistance. So many Nigerians um, are taking their chances going out to work because you need to work to earn what you're going to eat for the day, um, but also falling back uh, heavily on remittances from um, migrant workers or Nigerians outside of Nigeria, like myself. Um, half of Nigerians live in households. So 50% of Nigerians live in households that receive remittances. So that's a significant number of people relying on, on um, remittances from migrant workers. But then again, um, in the global context of the pandemic, incomes uh, have been cut or at least uh, um, curtailed um, globally. Um, and of course, migrant workers have to make decisions as to how to spread um, remittances across more households that are making demands on them. So just really to get uh, give a picture um, of the scale. So I want to just conclude by um, cycling back, to, and I think, I don't know, maybe teeing things up for Bulama a bit um, about the context or um, how um, high food prices combined with um, um, reduced availability, affordability and access combine quite worryingly with a high rate of poverty. And um, really the context and the challenge of this for um, social unrest uh, uh, in Nigeria. And I think Bulama will speak to the optic of um, human insecurity and conflict um, across um, Nigeria. And I think on that note, I will draw a line and hand over to uh, Bulama. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Lina, for giving us a very insightful vision on what is happening, not only on the micro economy, but also the macro economy in Nigeria. And I think it's really important that we remember that the remittances that Nigerians receive from the diaspora because of the impact globally um, that's going to, that we're all going through because of COVID-19, there's going to be an impact on the money that is sent back home. So we mustn't forget that in our conversation. And um, please, um, Dr. Lina, if you can share the gel off, um, the, the gel off index, never heard of that before. And it sounds very, very insightful. So please um, share that if you can, if not in the chat box, it could be also emailed out to all of our um, attendees. So thank you for that, really appreciate that. Now I, I'm going to now move on to our last um, speaker. Before I move on to Bulama, can please everybody that wants to ask a question, can they raise their hand so that we're aware of who they are so that when Bulama has finished, we can make sure that you get an opportunity to speak and um, ask questions to our great panelists. So Bulama is a, an analysis in the extremism policy unit of the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, where he focuses on sub-Saharan Africa. He has studied extremist groups in Africa, in particular Boko Haram for over a decade. Bulama has recently written several articles on violent extremist groups in Africa in the context of COVID-19, including for the Council on Foreign Relations, the Independent and the Telegraph. A lawyer by professional training, Bulama holds a degree in common and Islamic law, as well as a master of law degree from Bayo University in Kano, where he taught law and practiced as a human rights lawyer for five years. He is currently pursuing doctoral degree at SOAS, University of London. So I welcome Bulama to the floor. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chet, for your kind introduction. And thank you to the APPG and Chatham House for organizing this important uh, conversation. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, following up on the two speakers. Uh, of course, the picture doesn't appear to be great. and. Unfortunately, um, my presentation wouldn't uh, make it any better, especially for those of us that are interested in Nigeria and for the Nigerians amongst us. But I guess it's just telling ourselves the home truth and uh, 
getting us prepared for the worst and so that we can get the best. Uh, I'm going, to, I plan to uh, do my presentation in three headings. The first is to give the bigger picture. The second would be homing in to look at the northeastern part of Nigeria and then the northwest and the north central uh, uh, parts of Nigeria, and then conclude uh, with some concluding remarks. Now, on the bigger picture, we know that the security situation in Nigeria is deteriorating by the day. And Nigeria has never been so insecure. This might sound like a cliche, but it's not. That's what the data tells us. The data tells us that Nigeria has never been insecure, at least uh, as far as we know. Uh, for example, media reports uh, put together by intelligence groups uh, say in April and June this year, at least 2,700 Nigerians were killed by violence. And this is violence across 32 states of the Federation, and which means only four states haven't recorded uh, violence in the last, uh, between April and June of this year. But if you look at the data uh, further, you would see that in the past six months, that since January this year, at least 5,000 Nigerians have been killed by violence, whether extremist violence in the Northeast or other forms of violence like organized crimes in the North Central, um, things like the uh, farmer harder crisis or cropland crisis in the North Central part of Nigeria and the Niger, Niger Delta, but also the the I mean other crisis uh, in the Niger Delta, southern parts of Nigeria. And the point I make here is that crisis in Nigeria is not restricted to one state. It is not in one part of the country. It is pervasive in the whole of the country. And nobody is secure today in the country, at the in their homes, at work, on the street, in markets, or anywhere. And uh, yeah, so that's what the data tells us. And this is the first point I want to highlight. And there are many factors responsible for this. Part of it is the incapacity or, of the Nigeria police force, the failure of our policing system. Uh, we have an underfunded policing, poli uh, police that is also untrained. And that's why today there are active military de deployments in at least 32 states of the Federation. That is about 80% of Nigeria with the military deployed to bring back order, I mean, uh, to maintain law and order. That's like going to war without formal declaration. It is a state of emergency without the, uh, without the accountants of law. And that's uh, what's going on in the country. But what has COVID-19 done to this? What COVID-19 did to this horror, this gluesome data, is push it down the radar. Uh, two, three months ago, nothing would make the headlines if it is not COVID-19. And so, therefore, people might die, but they wouldn't make the headline. Nobody would even know that people have died because COVID-19 was the vogue. It also took away uh, uh, government attention, it diverted government attention, uh, policymakers' attention from those people helplessly dying, especially in rural, and rural Nigeria, because the government was fixated on COVID-19. And I'm not saying we shouldn't fight COVID-19. It is a right fight, but it is this need for a fine balancing act between COVID-19 and other crises in the country. Now that's the first point I wanted to make just to give us the bigger picture. Now, when we go to the Northeastern part of Nigeria, it is a crisis that has been raging for 11 years now. And Boko Haram has killed as an estimated 38,000 Nigerians from 2011 to date. Now, this crisis hasn't stopped. In fact, what we have seen when COVID started getting reported in Nigeria and around the Lake Chad region, were some of the deadliest Boko Haram attacks in history. For example, four days after Chad has reported its first COVID-19 case, 98 Chadian soldiers were killed by Boko Haram, and that was the deadliest in the country's history of fighting Boko Haram. On the same day, 47 
at least 47 Nigerian soldiers were killed by Boko Haram. And I say at least because that's the figure admitted by the Nigerian army. But other sources would say 200, others would say it was at least 100 soldiers. What then happened was the Nigerian military, which was getting ready for coronavirus, was diverted by Boko Haram and their head had to move from the headquarters in Abuja to the northeastern part of Nigeria to fight Boko Haram in a major onslaught. And that went on for a while. Now, but what you saw there when you had these deadliest Boko Haram attacks was Boko Haram and COVID-19 pulling government attention from the opposite directions. A government is forced to fight two deadly enemies with stretched resources. And I mean, you can't let either of the enemies off the hook because of the other. And that was the reality the Nigerian government had to uh, deal with. Now, of course, uh, President Buhari had related some of this spike in attacks to uh, the coronavirus restrictions. And this is something I would come to later. Now, still on Boko Haram, aside of the destruction in government attention, we also saw disinformation uh, from Boko Haram against uh, COVID-19 majors. Just like other extremist groups around the world, Boko Haram also came out with its messaging around the coronavirus. And unlike others, it didn't say it is the soldier of God or that it is fighting the disbelievers. The leader of Boko Haram, Shekau, came out saying, look, this disease is with us because we have, uh, we have failed to obey, obey God. We have failed to impose the law of God. And that's why this uh, disease is visiting us. But he went further to say, the cure for the coronavirus is the opposite of the prescribed, uh, prescribed health measures. He said the cure is in congregational prayers, is in observing Juma'a service, and it is in mingling with people uh, in religious and uh, socio-religious uh, gatherings. And Boko Haram doesn't have community support in the, north, uh, in, in the northern part of Nigeria. But what happened was this disinformation fed widely held misconceptions about the disease. We know that many Nigerians do not even believe that COVID-19 does exist. Some believe that it does exist, but they have other misconceptions, like it's saying the black race is immunized against the virus, or that it doesn't uh, impact on Africans or doesn't kill Africans and all sorts of misconceptions. Now, Boko Haram's disinformation fed into that, and therefore what you had was communities not, not obeying government social restriction measures and other prescribed health measures because they don't believe in the pandemic and because of the uh, misinformation coming from Boko Haram and feeding into widely held uh, misconceptions. Now, the next thing was coronavirus Im impacted on the ongoing joint military training of the multinational joint tax force. Around March, when COVID-19 started getting reported in Borno State, the multinational joint tax force had to stop their regular training and coordination activities so as to stop the virus from spreading among soldiers and troops uh, fighting the group. And that exercise only resumed earlier this month. And what you saw there was Boko Haram continuing to train, continue to attack, and our military being unable to train, unable to uh, do joint military training because of coronavirus uh, concerns. You also had counter messaging efforts against Boko Haram, especially face-to-face -face counter messaging efforts against Boko Haram by Muslim religious leaders in the North is impacted. And this is uh, talking about programs that go to IDP camps into communities to immunize young people against uh, getting recruited by Boko Haram. Boko Haram continued its recruitment, but because of lockdown measures and social distancing regulations, Muslim scholars and groups fighting Boko Haram ideologically couldn't continue their work. And this is another impact of, of the pandemic on the, on the security situation, but also on tracing and testing. The first COVID-19 case in Borno State was reported in an IDP camp uh, hosting 60,000 internally displaced people. 
and it was a nurse working with uh, medicine, medicine Without Borders that was reported to be the first case in Borno and who died from the virus. But because of the security situation in that part of the country, testing and tracing, tracing and testing became very limited because healthcare professionals and other professionals uh, in charge of that cannot go into the remote areas of the Lake Chad region, into the remote areas of the northeastern part of Nigeria uh, because of the fear of Boko Haram uh, and, and its attacks. And this is something that has a history. We have a history of Boko Haram uh, attacking health workers on polio vaccine exercise, uh, killing aid workers uh, working with Action Against Hunger or uh, ICRC workers, the International Committee of the Red Cross and others. And because of those fears, uh, testing and tracing was impacted in the Lake Chad uh, region in the northeastern part of Nigeria. And these are some of the short-term impact of the coronavirus on fighting Boko Haram and of Boko Haram on fighting or uh, containing coronavirus. But there are long-term long impact or short-term and long-term impact. And some of them are issues my co-panelists have uh, spoken to. Um, Idayat has spoken about uh, how government and its capacity was stretched. And Lina has spoken about poverty and the economic downturn. And what the economic downturn would do in the long and uh, in the short term, uh, in the medium and the long term, is weaken government capacity, increase fragility, and divert attention from extremist groups. And what would then that lead to is give opportunity for extremist group to step up their attacks and to recruit. For example, we know that poverty and radicalization and violence is a vicious cycle. Of course, we know that poverty alone doesn't explain radicalization, but it is one of those factors that have been established by credible researchers that, that contribute to, uh, to, to vulnerability to getting radicalized. When people are too poor, when they have grievances against governments that are economically uh, powerless to deliver, then what you get are people getting recruited into groups that aim to fight the governments and the social contract is weakened. And then another form of social contract, if you like, is established with those groups. And then the, 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 the future would be more violence and more radicalization and more for poverty. It's a vicious cycle, unfortunately. Now, we also have COVID-19 diverting Western government's attention. And that will impact on security in Nigeria, especially fighting Boko Haram. For example, we know that earlier this year, the British government announced that it was deploying additional 250 British troops to the Sahel to train uh, local soldiers fighting extremist groups in the Sahel, which are getting more and more connected with groups in the Lake Chad region. But that has now been impacted by COVID-19. It has been delayed because the initial report says around April, but it, they haven't been deployed in April. And we know that this will, even if it goes ahead, it will invariably be impacted maybe until the end of this year or, or, or so. And this is, uh, I mean, training and capacity building being impacted because of the coronavirus. And we already know that the US government was already discussing withdrawing troops from the Sahel even before the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And so with the coronavirus, what we might see is more uh, efforts towards withdrawing US military and maybe French soldiers. Of course, uh, French doesn't give any of those signals, but at least the US uh, soldiers might be withdrawn and that will impact on on, on the fight against extremism in the Sahel and the Lake Chad region. And I get it when people say, look, British and Western uh, soldiers have been there training our military, but we haven't succeeded in defeating these groups. But the answer I give is that, look, the situation would have been much, much worse if they weren't there. Because we lack capacity in lots of areas. And I mean, those of us who don't, I mean, who 
follow these developments closely, know that these deployments are important in building capacity and in ensuring that extremism and violence is contained in the Sahel. Now, the next thing I would mention is how Boko Haram could affect distribution of vaccine if and when one is developed. Like I said, Boko Haram has history of targeting health workers, especially those on uh, uh, polio vaccination exercise. And we know that once coronavirus pandemic, uh, I mean, uh, vaccine is developed, it will need to be distributed to the remotest areas of all countries, uh, including the northeastern part of Nigeria. And that will be impacted by the Boko Haram crisis, especially because there are at least nine local governments that are currently inaccessible. When they say inaccessible in diplomatic language, it means in reality that these local governments are under the control of Boko Haram. And there is evidence that Boko Haram is controlling at least five local governments, if not nine. And the United Nations recently declared after its helicopter was targeted that there are at least nine local governments that are inaccessible. When they say inaccessible to United Nations workers, inaccessible to the Nigerian army, the question that begs is who is then in control? Who can then access it? It is Boko Haram. And so the vaccine can't be delivered to those local governments. And if they aren't delivered to that, those local governments, there will be the pandemic left in some part of the world. And once you have this pandemic in one part of the world, no part of the world is safe because it is an interconnected world. And we saw how this pandemic spread from China like wildfire. Now, the, next, the last thing I would mention, which uh, Lina has spoken to, is the immediate victim of the insecurity in the northeastern part of Nigeria, but also in the north, uh, central and the northwest. And that is food production. We know that food production has been has been seriously impacted by the Boko Haram crisis. And that's because rural areas where farms, where you have large farms in the Northeast have been inaccessible for farmers. They are inaccessible even for security forces, not to talk uh, of uh, farmers. And also there are government regulations in the affected states like Yobe, Burno and, uh, and Adamawa against importing urea to those states. And you can't farm in the northeastern part of Nigeria and the north, northern part of Nigeria generally without fertilizer, without urea. And you, the, you can't import them to those states because Boko Haram uses them to manufacture explosives. And because of that reason, governments banned urea from that, those parts of the country. And that's agriculture being impacted uh, big time. I would now quickly move to the north. Uh, west and the north central and make uh, a few points. The crisis in the northwest also predates the, uh, the Buhari presidency. But what we have seen recently in the northwest and the north central part, parts of the country are uh, increase in attacks and their ferocity or intensity. The armed groups in that part of the country are becoming more and more sophisticated and they are stage in some of the most spectacular attacks we have seen uh, in the history of uh, those conflicts. We know that the crisis group reported recently that at least 8,000 people have been killed in the last 10 years in the north uh, eastern, uh, sorry, in the north, uh, in the northwestern part of Nigeria. And that's Katsina, Zamfara, uh, Sokoto, and other states around there. But we also know how kidnappers and other armed groups are there are uh, increasing in their uh, stepping up their attacks with impunity. Part of what we have seen that is related to coronavirus is how kidnappers wire coronavirus workers regalia to go into cities and abduct people. We have seen that in Kaduna, uh, especially inside Kaduna city where they would wear health workers regalia, they go into communities and communities would think these are health workers and they use that guys to abduct people. What the, uh, that does is increase insecurity in the communities, but also increase distrust for healthcare workers because you don't know who is genuine and you don't know who is a kidnapper. The next is how they also abducted health workers. They abducted health workers in places like Kasina 
And what that led to was protests by communities. And when you have protests by communities, that's a super spreader of coronavirus. And so it's, a, it's that multiplier effect of one thing leading to another, and then it becomes a vicious cycle of uh, um, uh, an unfortunate incident feeding another unfortunate incident. But we have also seen increased system systematic attacks in the southern part of Kaduna, mostly on Christian communities in that part of the country. And my hunch is that these attacks are being staged by a Boko Haram splinter group called Ansaru. Ansaru splintered from Boko Haram in 2012. They have always been based in the northwestern part of Nigeria because they flee from they fled from the northeast because Sheka was killing them, and they came to the northwest. And they have a publicly declared specific policy of targeting Christian civilians. They say we don't kill Muslim civilians. And when you see Christian communities, especially in southern Kaduna, being attacked in that way, and for example, the attack we saw on Sunday was 18 people killed at a wedding party on a Sunday night, and none of them was abducted. No one was abducted from there. No, no property was stolen, but 18 people were killed and 30 were injured, some critically. And it begs the question, if they were kidnappers, why didn't they kidnap them instead of killing them and ask for ransom? If they were armed robbers, what would you get from a wedding party? Nobody goes to a party with a lot of money. I mean, my hunch is that it is Boko Haram, but government is distracted with COVID-19. And I repeat, I am not saying we shouldn't fight COVID-19. I am saying we have to find a way of balancing it with uh, tackling other challenges in the country. Uh, so yeah, what, that's what we, we are seeing in the southern part of Kaduna and also other parts of the north central part of Nigeria where you have the farmer harder crisis that has killed thousands of people, at least 2,000 people last year and the attacks continue. But it not, it's not only the farmer harder crisis, you also have communal clashes in places like Benue between the thieves and others you have a crisis in the Niger Delta, as I mentioned, but all these have been put down the radar because of COVID-19. And the president, uh, like I said, said on June 12th that these attacks were as a result of the lockdown measures. But I was like, no, it should be the, op it should be the opposite. If you have lockdown and you have restricted vehicles from movement, that should help you in fighting uh, extremist groups that should help you in fighting criminal groups because any vehicle you see moving should be a suspect vehicle and in that way you can easily detect and arrest those you need to arrest or fight those you need to fight but then unfortunately all these things have gone down the radar uh, Nigerians are getting killed by the day nothing is cheaper than human blood today in Nigeria and we hear very little of that uh, because we are obsessed with uh, coronavirus. And unfortunately, the news coming from South Africa isn't good because the hope is that because uh, in the last few months, we thought Africa has been saved of the worst of the coronavirus pandemic. But when you have 30% increase in one week in South Africa, most of whom are black, when you have spikes in places like Madagascar, uh, Kenya and other places, you might begin to worry that you might see that in sub-Saharan Africa. And if there is a widespread pandemic in sub-Saharan Africa, anywhere the like of where we saw in, in Europe, that will be utterly devastating. It will be devastating not only for the lives it will take and a healthcare system that, that it, the healthcare system that it will stretch, but also how extremist group might uh, exploit that to their advantage, both ideologically, strategically, and operationally. Uh, to, I mean, not to overshoot, I will stop here. I can see that Kate is a very uh, patient chair. In Nigeria, we can't call your name without uh, saying honorable uh, Kate. Uh, yeah, but that's the British system. We, we say Kate, uh, yeah, in Nigeria, we say honorable or distinguished, even though the honor and the distinguished in Nigeria is uh, something to be, <laughs> Yeah, I will stop here. I'm happy to answer questions and uh, listen to feedback from the audience. Thank you very much for the opportunity again. We're opportunity now for questions. And I can see that we've got quite a few raised hands. 
I'm going to um, ask Joel um, to speak first. Joel, and um, if you can please tell us who you are and who you're representing. And I'm going to then have two more speakers, if we can be quick, so we can at least get two rounds in. So we'll have three speakers. Please direct who you're going to ask the question to. And, um, and then if we can do that quickly, we can get another round in. So I'm going to allow Joel um, Poplu to speak. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Joel. Please yeah, go I'm, ahead. I'm Joel Popola. I live in the northeast of England, uh, in Nigeria. And uh, uh, my concern about Nigeria is a bit disturbing uh, because uh, before COVID, the major problem we have in Nigeria is we don't have access to our elected representatives. So there is no engagement between the people and the elected representative. So when there is no connection, there is no, if you send an email to them, there will not be reply. You can't call them. You can send message to them on social media. They will not reply you. Then there is issue of distrust before COVID. So it is very difficult, extremely difficult for the people to trust news they are, they, that is peddling around because they can't confirm those news from the elected representatives. Immediately they get, the, get voted to the office, they, they dispatch to Abuja. You can't reach them. You can't connect with them. And it gives a very huge di distrust in our political system. My great concern now is about the out of school children this during uh, this uh, COVID period. Before now, we have about every one in five children in the world that is out of school children are Nigerian. Every one in five is Nigerian. About 10.5 million of age five to 14 that are out of school, this is post COVID, are Nigerians. Then, okay. now that education has moved online. Sorry, Joel, can I interrupt? Can you just ask the question, please? Thank you for your observation. Okay. The question is what is the country doing mm -hmm. to support children Thank you. who are out of school now? What is the government doing to support them? Thank you. Let me get on to the next person. Thank you so much, Joel. The next question, um, person is Eleanor Bennett. Hello? Hi, uh, Eleanor Bennett. Uh, so as COVID-19 vaccine, uh, vaccine conspiracies have proliferated on a global scale, for example, that the vaccine is a ruse to inject people with microchips or make them infertile or even just to kill them, how is this manifested in Nigeria and what impacts could that have on vaccine rollout? Thank you, Eleanor. Next question, next person to ask a question will be Ibrahim al Bakiri. If you could introduce yourself. And then once Ibrahim has asked his question, if the panelists could answer them and then we can move on to the next. Hello. Hello, Ibrahim. Please go ahead. Do you get me, uh, Kit? Hi, I got you now. Yeah, ask the question. Okay, thank you. My name is Ibrahim al Bakri and I'm from Soas. And this question is particularly for Idayat Hassan. And Idayat, you spoke about federalism, uh, your three-tier system of, federal, of, of decentralization in Nigeria from the federal government, the state, and the local government area. I want to know how is federalism and decentralization affecting the capacity of the state to respond to COVID-19? Is, your, uh, is the Nigerian system of decentralization and local government in any way facilitating the response or in any way undermining it? And what lesson can be learned from this uh, so as to, de uh, to design an appropriate or more effective uh, policy of decentralization moving forward in Nigeria? Thank you, Ibrahim. If I could ask um, the panelists to try to um, answer those questions very, very quickly so we can at least get one more round in because we're coming near to the end of the session. Thank you. So whoever wants to go first, thank you. Oh. 
Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ibrahim. To so the first question, I think that it's a two-way thing. Decentralization is facilitating response and it's also injuring. So if you look at Lagos, they have the best response. They have the norm, highest numbers of testing. They have the most in terms of capacity and their capacity as a state, like when I started, became very obvious in revenue generation, infrastructural development, with the way they were able to address COVID-19. And that's not the first time they are doing it. They also saved Nigeria when Ebola, they're doing the Ebola virus pandemic uh, as well. So this, but in other states, it's actually injuring responses because for so long, Nigerians are focused more at the national level, which is Abuja, compared to holding elected officials accountable at the local level. The local government system is completely non-existent. And that is why we have problems with information flowing down to the people such that they can trust um, some of if COVID-19 is real, which comes to the question of vaccine also. The same way it's going all over the world, it's the same way it's reverberating locally because of the disinformation associated with this pandemic itself or the info, info uh, media uh, system we had. So videos, audios are surfacing, particularly on WhatsApp and on Facebook and in local languages already talking about the fact that this vaccine that will be produced is actually to depopulate the uh, people. It's to... Oh. Oh. And maybe just answer the question which has been asked to you, and then the other questions can be picked up by the other panelists, so that at least we can get another round in. Thank you. Should I go? Yeah, I, I think um, Idayat really covered uh, questions around uh, uh, the vaccine um, challenges. And I think Bulama also reflected that in terms of the challenges of uh, a vaccine rollout, uh, potential challenges of vaccine rollout in uh, many parts of Northern Nigeria. But of course, issues with regards to uh, um, um, disinformation um, have been flagged all across the country. Um, there is a, an existing history of, uh, of distrust in immunization programs that have had quite uh, unfortunate uh, um, uh, outcomes with um, immunization workers. I think this was 2010, I might get the wrong, the year wrong, but in Kano and Katsina, parts of Northwest Nigeria um, around immunization programs for, for other uh, uh, diseases, uh, uh, I think childhood uh, diseases, I think it was polio or so, um, um, healthcare workers were attacked. And, and so there's, there is a record of this and a history of this. So all of this will be happening in the context of this disinformation, widespread mistrust. I think one of the participants uh, responded along those lines. So these are realities that we know exist on the ground. Um, what I wanted to just highlight, and um, as though we don't have already an anthill or a mountain of challenges, is the fact that in the revised uh, uh, national budget, um, it I correct me if I'm, I, I'm wrong, um, the, um, the budget line or spending for healthcare and education has been cut, healthcare spe specifically has been cut 40%. So you, we're talking in the midst of a pandemic, um, there is a cut to the healthcare budget. I think the expectations um, that were built into the uh, rapid uh, financing uh, um, uh, mechanisms um, that were triggered that brought about um, um, stimulus packages or at least financing uh, uh, um, instruments for Nigeria, I think it was 3.4 billion US dollars. Uh, part of it, or at least the idea behind some parts of it was supporting uh, healthcare response. Um, and I think most people imagined that that would be reflected in the budget with a boost rather than a cut to healthcare, um, healthcare spending. Um, so besides the challenges or what we can potentially see in terms of uh, the vaccine itself, um, these cuts will really, really uh, be problematic for ongoing existing immunization programs. 
um, real issues for primary um, healthcare access provision, of particularly rural areas. So all of this happens against the backdrop of these uh, um, existing healthcare uh, uh, um, challenges around primary healthcare, around maternal healthcare. So just threading it all together and, and uh, joining them up. Yeah, uh, I will just uh, speak a few words on the first two questions. Uh, the first is the question around what the government is doing or governments are doing uh, around um, out of sc school children. And it's a great question. But for me, the first question is what's the, it's the government doing about children that are in school. Uh, what we have seen uh, when this pandemic started was European countries, uh, the US trying to pivot to uh, to virtual learning in order to bridge the gap that will be created by too long uh, stay at home. And I worry when I see in the West uh, discussions around how being out of school for one month would, for example, uh, widen the gap between the poor and the, and the rich. But what you had in Africa, but especially in Nigeria, was government doing nothing about school, saying we would continue feeding the children but nothing was uh, implemented around, for example, education through radio. And radio is a powerful thing in Nigeria. We might not be able to do it online, but radio and television could have been used to bridge the gap to, to, to ameliorate the situation created by the lockdown measures. But what we saw was nothing was done and the government came out to say, we are canceling the SSCE. We are canceling a whole year in people's life and they would, be able to, they would not be able to do anything for that year. Of course, there was pressure and that was recanted. The other thing we saw in education was out of school children who are mostly in the north, most of whom are in the Quranic system of education called al Majri system. What we saw was a rash decision from governments, from governors to scrap the al Majri system using the pandemic as a guide without developing any better alternative for them. When we knew that the uh, former president, Jonathan, uh, 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 came with a very laudable policy of modernizing the system of education in a way that will make it good for this uh, for this period and time, but also uh, make it relevant, uh, uh, I mean, in a way, but uh, governor said we are scrapping it and that's what we got in, the, uh, in, in terms of education. Maybe the short answer is that nothing to write home about uh, in the in the education sector. Uh, the final point I want to make is the vaccine question. And we know that this, uh, this information around vaccine have been going on in Nigeria, but as Lina said, and as I alluded to in the presentation, this has a long history in Nigeria. And it is not only uh, a, a side stream or an extreme view in Nigeria, it is a mainstream view, especially in Northern Nigeria, where you had history of elected governors saying we won't allow our children to be immunized because they are being sterilized by uh, uh, polio vaccines. This will come up again when we uh, find a, a vaccine for coronavirus. Maybe the recommendation we would make is to start a proactive uh, information campaign around the vaccine before it is developed. So that by the time it is developed, the ground might have been prepared for it to be accepted, or at least for the for the aggression against the 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 the, the vaccine to be diluted. I will stop here, Kate. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll be able to get three more questions. If everyone is really quick, um, it will allow um, our great panelists to be able to give their response. As you can see, it's not it's not straightforward when you have to answer these questions. There's a lot to be said. <laughs> So I'm going to go to Bola Akanji, um, and then following from Bola, there will be Joyce um, Adewumi. Okay, hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, Bola. Please go oh, ahead. Okay. okay, so I'm calling from the US. Um, I'm a Nigerian uh, socioeconomist. And an agri-economist based in the U.S. So uh, I I have briefly looked at the Jollof index, you know that um, was uh, the, the link was sent, and uh, just my rough look at it uh, shows that the price index for food seemed to have dropped 
uh, during the COVID period, implying that food prices uh, dropped. I'm not sure if I'm wrong, but then that takes me to my real question. I am concerned that the food price index is going to hike up precipitously in the next planting, I mean, uh, the next um, food season, that the next harvest season, because we seem to be ignoring the immediate uh, supply response of farmers in the rural areas. Uh, the food systems, the, the food supply chain, the input supply chain have been disrupted and farmers, individual farming households are deploying their own coping strategies, you know, by uh, perhaps uh, intra-household uh, distribution of food and of also decisions about what to plant and yeah. what not to plant, uh, given that this is the, the, the heart of the planting season. So what, I, what the fear is that this is going to show up more in the next uh, uh, harvest season when we see that farmers have cut back on the production of critical uh, staples because the, the, the market channels have been truncated. I do not see the government looking at this. I think we're looking at the immediate rather than looking at the, at the future. Sorry so, to yeah. so this is likely to have serious effect on uh, food security. Uh, in, especially in the in the urban areas, because rural uh, based households would usually have some kind of food exchange, but in the urban areas, it's going to result in serious. In okay, thank you, Paula. Okay. thank you so much, Paula. I have to get. I think we can only get one more question in, um, and that will be um, Joyce. Joyce? Okay, we'll have to go to somebody else now. Um, Emmanuel Ibekwe? Okay, Emmanuel, go ahead. Emmanuel, go ahead. Okay, I think we we will just ask, I'll ask the panelists to answer um, Joyce's question. I think I'll go, since I introduced the Jalop Index, yes. <laughs> I think I'll go, I'll take that question. Um, so I don't, maybe have a, a second look at it um, because the data points are extracted from it. And if you see the graph, it shows that food prices have tended upwards since uh, um, data or was collected on food prices since the index began in 2016. And in um, the presentation uh, I made, I referenced as well um, the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics Living Standard Survey, which showed that more households cannot afford food and around about 37% of households uh, um, are are vulnerable have been have been exposed to uh, um, the increase in food prices. So um, maybe get a chance to listen to the uh, webinar. I won't go over what I said about you know food prices increasing for fifty percent in Lagos. So exactly what you said, Joyce. Uh, food prices have incre increased, particularly in urban areas. Rural uh, farmers are unable to get um, their goods to market. So there's been a lot of um, farm produce uh, uh, losses and spoilage, and as well, you know, food crises. It's so just the vicious circle of um, um, food supply chain disruptions, and as well, the point you were making about food production, um, the high horizon of food production um, um, moving forward is equally affected. So I kind of touched up on all of those in, in, the, in my early presentation. Thank you, Thank you so much, Nina. I really appreciate that answer. Unfortunately, we're coming um, close to the end of our session now. Um, so I'm going to ask the panelists, um, I'm going to give them a minute each to um, sum up um, what they want the attendees to take away and to think of and how we get ready for post-pandemic 
pandemic and see how we can prepare for Nigeria and, you know, globally as well, wherever we are, because we've had some people speaking from the US, but I know in the US we've, they've got their own challenges as we do in the UK and in Nigeria. So I, if I ask, whoever wants to start first, Lena, maybe? <laughs> yeah, I, think, I, I think I'll just continue on the food theme because I tried to integrate that in my presentation when I mentioned that Nigeria's borders have been closed since August of 2019. Um, it's a reflection of a reality that wasn't particularly accurate back then, but even increasingly out of step with reality today, given the context of the pandemic. Um, there needs to definitely be a greater emphasis for the Nigerian government on making food, uh, um, uh, focusing on pricing and food availability and affordability. Unfortunately, or it's just the reality of things, um, uh, uh, Nigeria is uh, food import dependent. That has not changed in the last nine months. So um, the combination of the border closure, the pandemic is the reason why food costs so much in Nigeria. Food production has not scaled up within the uh, intervening months to match this demand. Um, so I think addressing that reality and relieving the pressure on household incomes that have evaporated and are not being replaced through remittances and the like is an immediate priority, particularly as uh, um, relief assistance from the government is unable or is still trying to catch up with identifying the actual vulnerable people, um, pe um, people and households at risk at this point in time. So there needs to be more of an effort, more of a leadership role um, by the federal government. Um, President Buhari is heading the regional response, the West African response to the pandemic. So it would really um, be reflective of this reality if the president also led in, um, in the reality of addressing, you know, moving food across borders, because that's the reality that Nigeria is in. Thank, Thank you so much for your analysis and your rounding up, Lena. Um, can I now ask um, Gulama to um, give us a minute, if you can? Sure. Uh, thank you, Chet. Um, yeah, I'll just uh, round up with uh, three quick points. The first is to say, uh, for me, what stands out, what strikes me is the need for governments to balance the need between fighting uh, or containing coronavirus and fighting insecurity in Nigeria. Insecurity is what is bothering Nigerians more than anything today. Nigerians are literally begging to be let to leave. They just want to live their lives. And if governments cannot discharge this primary responsibility of securing lives and property, then we are in danger. And the first thing to do there is for government to accept that there is a problem, to come to terms with the reality. What we get, the narrative we get from government, including from uh, President Buhari's last speech, and the head of uh, the chief of service, uh, the chiefs of service, is that Boko Haram has been defeated, that the criminal guns in the Northeast and this insecurity in the Northwest and other uh, parts of the country uh, they are on top of the situation, but they are clearly not, not on top of the situation. It is deteriorating. And if you don't accept that there is a challenge, you can't get, uh, you can't get to the top of the challenge if you continue to flatter yourself that you are already there. Finally, the most impacted thing, uh, and I agree with Bola, that is food production. For example, in Basari, local government of Kazina State, one of the local governments af uh, affected by insecurity, 43% of farmers couldn't farm last fa uh, farming season. And this time around, they are predicting that at least 50% of them cannot farm because one third of them have already been even displaced from their places. So borders are closed. The Naira has been de devaluated. Uh, the economy is getting hit and then put uh, production is falling because of insecurity. And if we don't uh, take care of insecurity, all other problems would continue to escalate because it's a vicious cycle. So I think it's, it's, it's important, it's vital for government to accept that there is a problem, overhaul our security system, especially the military, but also reform our policing system so that we can live in our country just our normal way of life. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now can I um, ask Diana 
Ayat to um, give us a summary and thoughts for people to take away when we um, start to battle in, in the, at the forefront against this COVID-19. You're on mute. Okay, yeah. The COVID-19 pandemic has actually taught us that health can actually cripple the economy and it can cripple politics. But it's also important to point out that this pandemic has again reflected the core challenges Nigeria has been facing as a country. That is the issue of insecurity, the economy, and the breakdown of trust between the government and the government. And it's these tricky challenges that is also impacting the response. So it's given us an opportunity to actually rebuild citizenship, to rebuild trust between the government and the government. And most importantly, is also for people themselves to use this as we are calling on government and placing it on government that this is, a, this is an opportunity for us to address all the existing challenges as is a bulwark, it's an opportunity, but it's also an opportunity for citizens to also reclaim their own citizenship and know that the issue of graft, the corruption, the dilapidation, the inability of us to hold elected government accountable at all levels is what we are all facing now. And this is good in the sense that irrespective of class, middle class, the lower class, the rich, we are all caught in this. And I think lastly, it's also another opportunity for the global community to convey and work together, both in research and development, both in terms of lawmaking like the APPG, to understand that is as a collaborative of nations, it's partnership that can actually lead us out of this pandemic that faces the whole world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. So you left us with some really strong words on how we can work together. And also, you made it very clear, coronavirus can affect you no matter who you are, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're working class, upper class. And also, you spoke of opportunities, possible opportunities of how we need to change the world order and change the relationships that we have with politicians, with civilians, and how we make this world better. And it's not a utopia. I think it's now opportunity to reset the button. So I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank your contributions. Thank you for your questions, everybody. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to everybody, but we've, we've been here for an hour and a half. We could be here for longer, as you can see, um, but we, we have to bring it to a close. And I just want to say thank you for your contribution. Thank you for being part of your party group work. And I believe that we've got plenty more work to do from this point onwards. And please, please, please use the vehicle of the All Party Group to get the message out and for us to start talking to each other. That's one thing that this um, pandemic has shown us that we seem to be meeting more and speaking more in a way that we never used to, and let's make the most of it. There's never been an All Party Group meeting where I've had someone from the US on the line. So I'm really happy about that. But um, in all seriousness, thank you again for being part of this session. Thank you for your thoughts. Please, all attendees, take this away and let's make this world better. Thank you, Chatham House. Thank you, Yusuf, um, my facilitator. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>